So like I'm, his contract's just gone, and they picked up Paraguado. He's going to get re-signed for 49 games. Wow! That is the first time I've ever seen that happen. Yasu's contract, we're using him, so we need to renew it. We're not going to play 11 games, but there you go. However, we're going to play a few. And unfortunately, it does last a while, but we're making good progress here, guys. Not long left. Uh, at that point where I'd rather it be over sooner rather than later, so hopefully we can push forward and get that done. If you have no interest in playing, you can sit in certain spots, which makes every team on every player on every team spin in circles, so you can get a goal or two and then just sit and watch something else. But because it's turn-based, you can just watch something while you're doing it, and that kind of alleviates a lot of the boring parts of Blitzball, I find. I mean, if you love Blitzball, it could be awesome, but I've played a little bit too much of it in my time. And when I first started playing on this most recent file, I was dead into it, it was super fun. But it it fades really quick, I find. And it's a shame too, because it's a fun sport, it's just... I don't know. Cards, every single time, I'm, I'm enthralled by cards, I love them. That stupid math game on 10-2 wasn't bad, but... It's one of those things where sometimes it felt like hard work when you were playing it, especially if it was against a trickier opponent. Like, if you were on the ball and you could focus, you'd be okay, and it could be fun. But it was still maths at the end of the day, and if you don't like maths, then you're not going to enjoy it. And there's... I can't really remember too many other, like, persistent mini-games before that. Like, seven... I suppose you could go to the Gold Saucer and do those mini-games there, but they were fucking trash. But you see how people are spinning? They always spin like that when you go near the bottom of the circle. I don't know why. This guy's got really bad attack. But he's got decent endurance, so... He's gonna try and score. And he might score. This'll be interesting to see just how... If we get super goalie, we're okay. But if we, he's gonna get super goalie. Ooh, this could go in. That was close. And he gets it to Wedge, and Wedge is going to make a sprint. Go on, Wedge. But whoever that is on him is just as fast as he is, but he's a little bit quicker, but nowhere near as quick as he used to be. So she is quick. Dorham. She can't stop him, though, and that keeper cannot stop this. Get that wither tackle on. But I really should be talking movies, man. Whenever I have, like, a dead zone in a video and I need to fill it with something, I generally just ramble. And a lot of the times it's okay. But I've been watching so many films in the last year and I've not talked about any of them. And anybody who's been with me a while remembers I used to talk a lot about films. Of course, there's people who don't like that, but there were always people that did. And I liked it and that's the main thing. So I should really talk about them. But the thing I find is I forget which ones I've watched. So I should really get a list of all the ones that I've been meaning to talk about. Like The Maze Runner which I thought was profoundly stupid. And there was this amazing scene in this maze room, because if you don't know what this is about, it's based on this book. Uh, I have no idea how this film got made. I assume it's because the Hunger Games did so well at the cinema. So everybody's like, oh, who's got a book that's got a bunch of like preteens who are all moody and doing adult things and the world relies on them? So we've had this resurgence of teens saving the world. It's like a, a Japanese fantasy, only there's no panty shots and no rape. But still, you know, that, that Japanese influence is felt. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> felt. Get it? Felt up now? Never mind. But it's weird. So they've got these bunch of kids in this maze, which is they get dumped in this little circle of dirt that's got a bit of grass and a wood and they made a camp and each of the kids have been there in like longer steads than the others. And every so often, this maze opens up, and they have whoever's the fastest and doesn't whine a lot runs into this maze to try and map it, so they can try and find a way out. Uh, surprise, surprise, spoiler, spoiler, they've already mapped all the maze, there is no way out, it's just kind of weird. So there's this hierarchy that's that's turned up within these boys, because they've created a, a, you know, a level of society, because that's all they have now, that's their entire life. 
And then this kid gets sent in who mixes it up because he's different, who's the main character, and he ends up, you know, getting them out of this maze. You know, spoiler alert, you didn't see that coming. Rocky fights in the end of the film too, but there's a spoiler. Darth Vader looks farther, whatever. But there's this one scene where they introduce a girl. There is, imagine this, there's 20 boys, all ranging between 7 and 16 maybe. And I'm being kind with 16 because I think it's a bit older. Which means they are in the the most ravenous, most explosively volatile hormonal period of their life. And they introduce like a 16 year old girl to the mix. And as much as I respect its tastefulness and its, you know, its PG-12 rating, there is no place on this planet where that probability of those numbers doesn't involve something bad happening to that girl. And I don't want to see it, nor am I wanting it to be a thing or condoning it, but just realistically, there's too much evil in this world, guys. There's far too much of it. There is not enough niceness, and the world is an ugly place, yet there's nothing even remotely hinted at, at the guys wanting to be anything towards this girl, other than curious, which is a, a wonderful naivety, but just not true. But to kind of, you know, appease people thinking the exact same thing as me, is that she's going to get gang raped here and it's going to be awful. They had her up on this tower, like with a stick, telling him to get away from her, which is as close to, you know, we understand in the real world this probably is much darker than we've made it appear. But I was still kind of baffled by the whole concept of it, like, why would they put her in? Because there must have been tests in the past where she was accidentally murdered because there was a bunch of horny kids trying to smother her with a bunch of hormonal feelings with no knowledge of exactly what they are and no real knowledge of the outlet other than woman I must touch it with my caveman instincts like it was just the most baffling thing ever and then to add insult to injury there's a big twist which was utter shit and then there's gonna be two more films and it's like well I'm glad I didn't go to the cinema to see that bag of dicks and that was the Maze Runner so watch it at your own peril you might like it maybe you read the book and the book's amazing but at the end of the day she would have been completely destroyed in every orifice that she owns and it would have been tragic and awful and I'm kind of glad they didn't do it but kind of baffled that they, they didn't insinuate it well that moves me swiftly onto the film I watched the other day which is a film called John Wick where Keanu Reeves the acting extraordinaire gets to play a retired hitman whose wife has passed away and he, in his grieving, in his bereavement for her, she gives him a pet dog as a, as like a final farewell to help him grieve. And of course, a mobster's Russian kid who's an asshole ends up stealing his car and killing his dog during the robbery. And it's, it's paced in, in a kind of really nice way where it shows you the methodical nature of Keanu Reeves' character. It also gives you the the idea that there's something more to him than what you see, because in all these films that's the, the trend, isn't it? He's either ex-SAS or ex-Hitman or whatever, he's some kind of badass. But it's never overtly shown, it's just kind of hinted at, and in this film it's hinted at because he can speak Russian and he's not intimidated by a gang of youths, which is, you know, he's, he's got to be a Hitman or something. So this happens. These kids try and pawn his car off at this local, like, shark shop. And the the person who owns the shop knows who John Wicks is and recognises his car. So he tells him to get out, kind of thing. And, of course, John rides up or, or catches a bus or wherever he does to get there. I think he catches a bus. Not that it's important, yet I'm dwelling on details because it's kind of how it works sometimes. And he sits down with this dude for a drink. And this dude's like, "What you know, what are you going to do? It's Ivan's kid, and Ivan is this big, bad, nasty mob leader who John Wicks used to work as. And of course it comes out that John Wicks is the guy that the nasty mob hired to do the things that they couldn't do themselves. So of course he's this big badass. And then from that point onwards the film kind of devolves into Keanu Reeves in these highly choreographed gun fights with lots of judo throws and takedowns for some strange reason. And a lot of interesting cameos from, from actors that I really like. And the whole film is if you're not a fan of the whole, you know, Death Wish setup, the whole Charles Bronson revenge thing, then you're probably not going to enjoy it because this is, do not be 
you're not perturbed here. This is action for the sake of action. It has very little plot. There is very little development needed because all you need to know is that he is very sad over the death of his wife and thus the death of his dog and he knows how to kill people. So now he's going to spend an hour and 40 minutes killing everybody associated with the people that hurt him. And that is what you're going to get. And for that much, it's interesting. I enjoyed it. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. But that's my kind of film all over because I grew up with, with action movies and it's a little bit more graceful than your standard cheesy action movie. But at the same time, it's still one guy killing hundreds of dudes in a completely unrealistic situation. Which, for some, for some reason, people can't disconnect their brain when they watch things like that. They, they can't enjoy them for that reason. And I find that very strange because it doesn't bother me. You could have him punching a bear to death and I'd still dig it if it was cool enough to watch and if it was well made. But a lot of cool stuff in that. One thing I did like about that film in particular is a lot of films seem to forget that the lethality of a weapon starts at the barrel. So they do a lot of things at range. Whereas because he was taking people down a lot and he was doing all these crazy judo throws, he would always finish them off with an execution by shooting them point blank range in the face. And of course, back in the day when they were using squibs and they were using you know lesser technologies, even though I, I do believe the, the practical effects are much better than the digital ones personally, it was harder to do that. And in a lot of films, you might have noticed this and thought it was a continuity error, a lot of the times they couldn't even point the guns at people because of the, the, the flash, the muzzle flyer from the, the, the blanks would burn people. So they had to point the gun slightly away from them, especially if it was the face and they would use cinematographic effects and directory, you know, and, and like camera tricks to, to make it appear like they were pointing guns at people. Not all the times, some productions are ghetto. But nowadays, muzzle flashes are digital, so the guns aren't even firing. And if they are firing, they probably don't have gunpowder or a muzzle flash for safety reasons. So you're able to do a lot more with them. And then the muzzle flashes are added all afterwards with, you know, visual effects technologies. When I went to university, one of my assignments was to create muzzle flashes for a gun. Uh, we, we did an entire scene. We had to do impact smashes of glass on a window. We had to colour correct the entire thing and we had to mask out a ton of stuff that wasn't necessary on, on a, several shots and then we had to create an appropriate muzzle flash. So it's actually easier than you think it would be but the finesse is in getting it to look subtle rather than overt even though I personally like me some crazy over the top muzzle flashes because I'm just that way. But they're able to do that in John Wick's because of that very thing because it's the digital nature of it they're able to do a lot of things that squibs and uh, blanks would make rather dangerous unless incredibly well set up. And that's the reason why films like The Killer and Hard Boiled are all the more impressive. Because the stuff that John Woo was doing with those poor Chinese stuntmen is unbelievable. Like, Chow Yun Fat will, in the interviews for those films, his hands were numb because they were vibrating so much from firing blanks. He couldn't feel his fingers because he was firing thousands of blanks every day on those intricate gunfights, which. Uh, uh, my favourite in Hollywood, in, in all of film, sorry, because technically it's not Hollywood, is it? And anybody who's seen those fights, even if you think it's ridiculous and stupid and extravagant and gun porn and uh, over the top and fetishistic and too much and not nice and glamorising violence, you still have to respect that that shit is fancy and it must have took weeks to shoot. But this is the killer cabeast, we're going to shit stomp him again because they're rubbish. The John Wicks, I expected it to be slightly different. I really liked the idea of that international hotel where all the assassins go and they use that special currency to get shit done but you can't do any work on it so it's kind of like a, a place of immunity. I liked that as a notion. I don't think they used it as well as they could have. Ian McShane was great as, as the kind of camp but dead serious flamboyant owner of said hotel. A lot of good like cameos. Kevin Nash is the guard, I thought it was funny. I think it's Kevin Nash anyway, it looks hell of a lot like him. But one of the things that took the sting out of John Wicks for me was watching the equaliser with Denzel Washington. Because aside from being a little bit cheesy, I think it's a better film for the progression of it. And if you don't know what this film is, 
Essentially, Denzel Washington plays somebody who works at like BNQ. I have no idea what the American equivalent is. Maybe Walmart, Costco. I have no idea. A place where they sell a lot of supplies like wood and paint and all that kind of stuff. And he works there as a person on the shop floor. And he's kind of meticulous, you know, very precise about what he does. You see him getting up early. You see him cleaning his house. You see him being almost compulsive in, his, in the way he approaches tasks. Very methodical man. You know, a very deep thinker, a tactician, which immediately tells you the dude's a badass because that's how all these films work. And he's quiet, he's soft spoken, he's funny, he's really nice to everybody, he's, you know, he's got a strong sense of justice. And throughout this story, it introduces you to a couple of the characters that he works with. It introduces you to this uh, hooker played by, is it Chloe Moretz, her from Kick Ass, who's a fantastic little actress. She's growing up now, which is good to see. She might be getting some more mature roles. And it introduces these scenarios where these people have something bad happen to them and there's no justice for it because, you know, that's what life's like, you know, that's the shit they don't teach you at school. And because Denzel Washington has the ability to do something and he feels compelled to, he can't really tell you why, he decides to act. And at first you're not entirely sure how it's going to go down. You know he's going to kick ass and you know he's going to be Denzel Washington because he's fucking Denzel Washington and he's amazing. He doesn't age. He's glorious but you're not too sure what it's going to be. And then there's a sequence where he walks into this mob restaurant who's the pimp of this girl who gets beaten up and put in hospital. And he walks into this room and there's a couple of heavies with this, this guy. There's like three or four of them. They're all bulky and, you know, greasy hair, long hair. The stereotypical villain, long greasy hair and a goatee because apparently that means you're evil. And then the boss is, you know, he's very cocky, very derogatory towards him and they're all talking Russian and, and being kind of assholes about it. And... Denzel just says to him, here's this money, gives him like 10 grand to buy this girl so that she doesn't have to be his prostitute anymore. And that's the last they'll ever see of it. But of course this dude doesn't take the money because he's a, he's a pimp and they think they're 10 men. So he starts walking out and you think, well, I thought something was going to kick off there. Surely something's going to happen here. And he gets to the door and he goes to open it and then he closes it. And then he sets his, his watch and he sets it for like 15 seconds and he goes back into this room and he kills all of them in like rapid succession and it's amazing it's awesome and he looks at his watch and he realizes that he's really slow he's, he's like it were 40 seconds instead of 15 and he's kind of surprised because of course it's insinuating that he used to be that good and we just saw him destroy this room thinking like whoa this is amazing but he's a little rusty he's a little older his reflexes aren't quite what they were and yet he's still so capable and from that point onwards, it becomes this linear sequence of uh, this this mob family then wants his blood because they want to know who hit this restaurant, and they end up sending in people to catch him. And it's this back and forth between them to to kind of settle this dispute. And it's very predictable. It's incredibly violent. But if that's the kind of film that you like, which to me that's that's the stuff I eat up because I love that kind of stuff. You know, it's it's, it's not my favourite type of film. But it's the stuff I was brought up on, and I have a fond place for it in my heart. And I recommend it a lot, but I'm not going to tell you it's original. I'm not going to tell you it's not generic in what it does, because you've seen this a million times. The only difference is it's Denzel Washington again. And technically, he's already done this. If you've seen Man on Fire, you kind of understand what this kind of, you know, process is. But I love Man on Fire, so it's, it's one of those films that I had a lot of fun with. And if you like them, you'll, you'll enjoy it too. But that's not to say that I don't have more classy tastes in films, because I watch anything. And speaking of uh, definitely a much darker tone of film, I watched a film called The The Homesman. It is the, I think it's the directorial debut of Tommy Lee Jones. That could be wrong. He directed this and he wrote it. He, he wrote the screenplay. And it's a western set in the West, and it's essentially, it is about this village that has to transfer a, a collection of insane women back in the West. And there is this, this sanctuary in, I think it's Iowa, that they can take these, these insane women to where they can get some help. But of course, this is back when, you know, people, journeys took weeks and months because they were crossing the vastness of America on horse and cart. So they pull straws on who, who gets to to sheriff this person, or to, to convoy her to this location. 
And a woman ends up winning. A woman played by Hilary Swank, I think it is. And... It is one of the bleakest westerns I've ever seen. And I'm talking, it's really dark, guys. But it's dark in one of those ways where you can't stop watching it, even though it is dark. And she's she's unwed, Hilary Swank. She's, she's kind of a progressive woman in an age where women have absolutely no purpose other than to clean, cook, and be broodmares. Which, unfortunately, is, is a tragic history that's lingering today. And she gets the job of transporting these women. Along the way, she ends up saving Tommy Lee Jones, who stars in this film, who's kind of this... Uh, ranch hand slash, you know, nefarious rogue who she saves his life when he's about to be hung for stealing a horse, I think it was. And he says he'll do anything because she saved him. So she tells him he has to accompany her to this place, which is like a like a two-month journey. And the stuff that happens in that film, wow, just wow. Like, it's about an hour and 40 minutes long. And I was enwrapped the entire time, even though all it is is a road trip movie in the Old West about two people, you know, fighting adversity to take these three insane women to Meryl Streep, who has this house that's going to help them. But the scenes, guys, wow. You have to really see it to, to get the full extent of it. But there are two that stand out that aren't spoilery, which are trying to, to give you the impression of just how crazy these women are if you weren't already... 100% down with their insanity. The first one is this German family where the, the German husband climbs into bed with the mother-in-law and his wife who's crazy and begins to have sex with his wife while his, her, mother, well, her mother is holding her and awake. It is one of the creepiest, most uncomfortable scenes of that nature I've ever seen. Just a completely aberrant situation, which when you think about it, probably wasn't that rare. Because there wasn't guest bedrooms back then unless you had some serious money, and that was probably as as normal then as anything else. As the concept of having one bath a year is to them, but to us we find it completely disgusting, yet yeah, that's how they lived. And that scene, oh goodness me, uncomfortable in so many ways. And then the next one... It all depends on how squeamish you are, slash how much of a, how much empathy you have. If you're a psychopath, you'll probably not find it too disturbing, but it is a crazy woman who gets a newborn baby and throws it in a toilet. And when you think about the conditions of what their outside toilets must have been like, you can imagine the wealth of infection and just how vulnerable babies are. It is one of the most shocking things I've seen in a film because of how real the baby looks and just how rough the, the scene is for, for just she just dumps it in the hole man it's wickedly dark but I can't say it wasn't a good film because I enjoyed the hell out of it and just at the end of it you want something maybe a little bit lighter unless you're doing a super serious you know really bleak session of movies which sometimes can be fun especially if you need a good cry <laughs> yeah if you've got like a, an emotional roller coaster of a movie and you need a good cry, that can be the best. But if you're not in that mood, it's probably just going to bum you out. And I think I followed it with Guardians of the Galaxy, which, if you've seen it, is the best kind of film to follow that kind of bleakness. Because it's really, it's upbeat, it's silly, it's got a good sense of humour to it, and it's fun. And I had absolutely no idea what it was about, because I've never heard of Guardians of the Galaxy. And when I watched it, I, I had a lot of fun with it, I enjoyed it a lot. I really liked the bad guy too, I thought the bad guy looked cool, and I thought he sounded cool as well. But, like a lot of movies, I think the way they made him appear strong kind of underwhelmed the final encounter. Because he was this dude that was essentially taking over all these galaxies, and he was talking back to this dude who was apparently this big deal, who I think was in, was in one of the Avengers movies. I have no idea who it was, but suffice to say, it was a fun, irreverent, silly, adventure movie and uh, I would like to see another one because it was a great film. But once again I've been talking and we're smashing them because they're an unfortunate side. But I, I did actually watch Transformers, the most recent one, and I really didn't want to. I had it for a while, wasn't going to watch it, and then I put it on, realised it was like three hours long and wondered who the hell is this film for because kids can't 
pay attention for that long. I don't care who they are. You'd have to have them on Thorazine. But I was surprised to, to find that the first hour of the film was, was a little bit more character development than your, your standard Transformers fare. But be under no illusion, guys. Once that film gets going, it is the Transformers that you know and hate. Unless you know, you're one of those rare people that finds it interesting to have all these Transformers that you remember from your childhood just fight for two hours in CGI that you can barely tell what's happening, who's who, and what the point of any of it is to begin with. But the good news is, Shia LaBeouf is not in it. So, if you hated it for him, he's not in it. If you hated it for all the other stuff, most of it's not in it, but it's still a Michael Bay movie. And instead you've got Mark Wahlberg and that guy who played Hood in Cloverfield, who I actually like, who gets a really small part in this, and it's probably the most interesting part, because I think he's funny. But can we go 11, 11 nil? We can certainly try. But at this moment in time, I'm sitting on the, the new Hercules movie with Dwayne Johnson. I have trepidations about watching it. Similar trepidations to what I had about the Godzilla movie, which I put off watching for ages, and then when I did watch, I was kind of disappointed with it, because I thought Cranston was going to be in it for longer. Because he was in the damn trailer all the time, and then ten minutes into the movie, he goes away, which is annoying. And then it leaves you with his son, who... He's a bulked up version of that kid from Kick-Ass, which was a bit jarring seeing him play that nerd and then coming into this and feeling like he was a little bit out of his depth. But hopefully he doesn't get typecast like Michael J. Fox did, where he will always play that guy, because he has that kind of face that never ages. <laughs> this is just rough. <laughs> But that, that Hercules, I'm scared of it because I really like Greek mythology. Greek mythology is one of those things that I grew up fascinated by and I used to read about it on Encarta and print it off and put it in like a little folder and, you know, and have this random folder full of stuff I could have just booted the computer up to read, but at the time I wanted it physically. <laughs> so I have a, a deep reverence for essentially what is now a dead religion is the only real good purpose for any religion, in my opinion. To sculpt culture for so long and then to gradually die out and be known for what it really is, which is a bunch of exaggerated stories that have been twisted so much now that all it really is is financial and, and political gain and nothing else. But this match is over. 13 nil's not too bad. Even if we tackle her, and we're going to tackle her because you'll never get past Wedge, we still can't score here as much as I would love to try and get one more because the distance is too long and look how fast the time goes during the animations, it's mad but always remember folks, if you are religious it's not my intention to insult your religion I want to insult corporations of religion organized religion Religion is an industrial complex. Because that's what it is. Ooh, is Agar gonna get dropped? No, 22 games. Judah, she's good. No, they got her back. He might get dropped, he got dropped last time. No, nope. got him. Interesting. It's either one more game or we've done. We did it, folks. League season is over. Oh, it took so long. It took so long. But finally, we're moving into the last phase of this playthrough. The only thing left to do now is hopefully kill things faster with attack reels to get Lux Fears so that we can hit the Dark Aeons. Then we'll kill Anima, then we'll kill the Major Sisters, then we'll kill Penance. Very shortly, we'll be getting the, the Major Sisters and Anima. Let's look forward to that episode. It might be a bonus one. Oh, we got an Ether as well. Awesome. But there you go, guys. Ten games, and you will have the league over. So I don't think I was using him, but this is the last of the, the blitz ball we're going to be playing anyway. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too boring. Uh, I, I personally felt it was a little bit boring, but 
Uh, that's why I started talking about different things. So hopefully you didn't. It didn't come across as I was as bored as I felt. <laughs> but I'm sure you'll tell me if you think uh, otherwise. <laughs>